At the turn of the century, the $200 billion semiconductor manufacturing industry across the globe joined hands and underwent a massive transition, maybe the last of its kind. That transition? They made their wafers larger. Sounds simple, right? But the 300mm wafer transition started in 1994, took nearly a decade, and cost the industry billions of dollars. In this video, we're going to look at the semiconductor industry's momentous transition from 200 to 300 millimeter wafers. But first, the Asianometry Patreon. I'll make it quick. Early access members get to see new videos and selected references for them before they're released to the public. It's not a lot of money, and I appreciate the support. Thanks, and on with the show. Throughout the second half of the 20th century, the industry sought to grow their wafers about 50% each decade without compromising on productivity and cost. In the early 1960s, the industry used wafers with diameters of about half an inch, or 13 millimeters. In the 1970s, the industry transitioned to 3 and 4 inch diameter wafers. For the 1980s, 5 inch and 6 inch wafers. Then in the 1990s, the industry went to the metric system, with 200 millimeter wafers, or about 8 inches. I will generally stick to the metric system. When the 2000s came around, the 50% growth prediction meant going from 200 millimeters to 300 millimeters, or 12 inch wafers. It had almost been like Moore's law for wafers. But why do this? For many years, Intel led and paid for the industry's previous transitions up to larger wafers. Their primary reason for doing so has been cost. A bigger wafer makes advanced semiconductor manufacturing more economically viable. To allow for a doubling of transistors on an integrated circuit every two years required a rising amount of work and investment. Increasing the size of the wafer helped dilute that cost by allowing manufacturers to put more dyes on a single wafer, at least theoretically. Moore's law requires the entire industry to increase its productivity by 25-30% to 30 each year. It has been calculated that wafer size transitions have historically accounted for 4 percentage points of that 25-30%. to 30%. Intel wanted another wafer transition to help with the yet again worsening cost situation. Yet by then, new concerns had emerged to give people pause about whether to do this next wafer transition. The move to 150mm had been relatively smooth, but when the industry leapt to 200mm in the 1990s, things got a little out of hand. The transition promised an over 20% reduction in cost per die, but arguably failed to live up to those expectations. First, it took a very long time, the longest of any prior wafer transition. 200mm processing tools first emerged in the late 1980s, but it took five years before the industry produced 200mm wafers in a significant quantity. Previously, it took three. And second, the cost got so high that it sapped away almost all of the savings. The transition cost an estimated $5 to $10 billion in 1990 dollars across the whole industry, or $11 to $22 billion today. That includes the cost of new tools, factory investments, losses in productivity, and so on. Things were only going to get worse. Early estimates found that it would cost the industry about $15 to $50 billion in 2006 dollars to complete the 300 millimeter transition. That is about 20 to $70 billion in 2022 far more than any single company can handle, even Intel. So, despite the fact that a 200mm wafer can hold 1.78 times as many dyes as a 150mm wafer, companies didn't get 1.78 times as many dyes per single dollar spent. Kinda sounds like a riddle, right? When does 1.78 not equal to 1.78? Nevertheless, a 300mm wafer can hold 2.25 times as many wafers as a 200mm wafer. Intel and the rest of the industry's leading manufacturers, Hitachi, IBM, Motorola, Samsung, and so on, still felt a 300mm transition was worth it. One of the big reasons why the 200mm transition had not delivered on its promises was a lack of consensus. Believe it or not, the industry could not agree on how thick the wafers should be. Because of that, for a period of time, wafer manufacturers had to produce wafers of two different thicknesses, 725 and 735 micrometers, an unnecessary cost. This time, the industry hashed it out early. In early 1994, nearly a decade before the transition's scheduled 2001 completion, the industry set up two international consortiums, 
I-300i, representing the American, European, and Taiwanese device manufacturers, and Silite for the Japanese manufacturers. In July 1994, those two met up at the Large Wafer Summit in San Francisco. There, they quickly decided on the wafer size and thickness. They then moved on to the other technical challenges, which are formidable. Moving an entire multi-billion dollar industry from 200 millimeters to 300 millimeters means changing and retooling every part of the semiconductor manufacturing process. Let us start with the wafers. Figuring out how to grow, cut, polish, and deliver a pure silicon wafer crystal so much larger than the previous generation of crystals turned out to be one of the biggest challenges of the industry transition. Today we grow semiconductor grade silicon wafers using something called the Chokrowski method. I spoke more about it in a previous video, but how it works is that you dip the seed crystal into a pool of molten silicon called a melt. Then you carefully pull it out of the melt while being rotated to essentially grow the crystal. Maybe it's just me, but I can't help but think about an ice cream bar dipped into chocolate. A 300 millimeter wafer, like Texas, is bigger. A 200 millimeter wafer crystal weighs about 90 kilograms. A 300 millimeter wafer crystal clocks in at over three times that, 300 kilograms or 660 pounds. That's heavier than an adult female polar bear and leads to new headaches for wafer manufacturers. Crystals are grown with thin necks just a few millimeters wide in order to reduce the occurrence of defects. But for the new ones, when engineers tried to grow these absolute units with prior methods, the crystals consistently broke their necks. The larger volume also affects the distribution of heat throughout the crystal. If one part of the crystal gets too hot while another part stays too cold, then that causes thermal stress and possibly cracking. So to be safe, you can only pull the crystal out of the melt half as fast as you would for a 200 millimeter crystal. This lower pulling rate, as it is called, limits the wafer manufacturer's throughput, meaning you can't make as many wafers in the same amount of time. Fortunately, the half as fast pulling rate is not slow enough to cancel out the crystal's 2.25 times size benefits. The 300 millimeter wafer transition occurred at the same time as the semiconductor industry was starting to move on to the 180 and 130 nanometer process node. As always, this means new design rules and defect requirements. For this particular node generation, the first micrometer of silicon on the wafer surface had to be completely free of all wafer defects. So now the wafer industry found itself with the challenge of making crystals that were simultaneously bigger and purer. And a bigger crystal is inherently susceptible to having more defects. There are generally two types of silicon defects. The first is a vacancy defect. This is where you have an empty hole, called a void or a vacancy, in the silicon crystal structure. The second is when extra silicon atoms jam together, mess up their crystal structure, and create defects. These dislocations, as they are called, tend to be larger, which is more of a pain to deal with. They might even spread across the crystal's width, which is a failure mode. These defects happen because of the local conditions at the point where the silicon melt solidifies onto the crystal. Keeping control of those conditions, oxygen most importantly of all, was extremely challenging and led to the industry considering what are called epitaxial wafers. Epitaxy is a fancy word that describes a fancy process. Here, you use chemical vapor deposition or physical vapor deposition to produce a layer of flawlessly pure crystal silicon onto the wafer. So, you don't have to worry so much about wafer growth purities or the sawing possibly causing dislocation defects, but the downside is that it is even slower and costs a whole lot too. All of these are technically difficult challenges and the manufacturers have to figure them out while also achieving scale and equal or better cost than the status quo. Semiconductor equipment suppliers faced several expectations when it came to this transition. First and foremost, they had to handle and process more wafers without proportionally increasing the tool's size. To do this, many of them started redesigning their products to put non-critical items underneath the clean room floor. Toolmakers also had to align their tools and practices with new industry standards and larger government regulations. 
and the lithography makers on top of all that had to do this while producing new, more sophisticated systems for the 180 and 130 nanometers process nodes. After the industry standards were set in 1995, the tool vendors started development in 1996 with an eye to roll out in 1998. At the start, the industry's big tool vendors estimated it would add about 40-70% to 70 more cost than with a 200mm system. This turned out to be an underestimate. A 2006 survey found that the equipment industry spent $11.6 billion on the transition, nine times more than the last transition. This is a lot, even for some of the richest companies out there. A 300mm fab is just bigger. Architects need to design for higher floor and ceiling loads, utility piping have to be rerouted to give workers more access to items, tools have to move some of their guts under the floors. But I think the biggest change was how they automated wafer handling. Wafers are never carried around raw. They are stored in things called a front opening unified pod, or FOOP, which preserves them in a pristine environment. The industry standard 300mm FOOP carries 25 wafers. Fully loaded, it weighs about 9 kilograms. Companies had already started to notice a rise in worker compensation claims and worker discomfort complaints with 200mm wafer foops, so the far heavier 300mm version necessitated the automating of basically all wafer transport inside the fab. In their 200mm fabs, Intel moved their foops around using rails. That vehicle could either be autonomously guided or manually pushed to the right equipment bay. The 300mm transition brought forth a new technology, the Overhead Hoist Transport System, or OHT. Moving these to the ceiling allowed Intel to squeeze together the equipment base from 9.5 feet to 6 feet, freeing up 3.5% more space inside the clean room. The downside was that these overhead hoists required new software and routing algorithms specifically for the clean rooms. Later case studies found that manufacturers struggled with the big software requirements involved, causing some aberrant behavior. By setting industry standards on everything from fab architecture to logistics to software integration, the industry was able to eliminate duplicative work. The Japanese managed to cut 11 different FOOP variants to just one, and accelerate wafer fab startup times. 200mm fabs at the time used to take 20 months to first hit wafer production. After the wafer transition, that number was cut down to 18 months, a substantial savings. The planning and coordination paid off. First started in 1994, the industry largely completed its transition by 2001. It has been 20 years since, and the industry is still using 300mm wafers. Talks to move to 450mm, the supposed next generation, haven't panned out. As I talked about in the first wafer video, the industry doesn't seem to have the energy to push towards it. Equipment development costs alone are estimated to be $25 billion, and the economic benefits are still murky. Furthermore, it's a way different industry now. At the start of the transition, the major industry players had been in the United States, Europe, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. Since then, China, Singapore, Thailand, and Malaysia had entered the game. Intel lost its position as the driver of the entire industry. There are many other companies now with significant say and their own incentives. Coordinating between all of them gets harder. I don't know how popular this video is going to be, but I am fascinated by the entire notion of this decade-long international effort between billion-dollar companies who are usually competitors. Recently, there has been a shortage in 200mm wafers. Fabricated Knowledge picked a beautiful quote from a recent earnings call by Sumco Management, one of the big wafer manufacturers. There is no way to increase 200mm volume. The equipment is no longer available, and older facilities that have been idled are obsolete. So increasing volume is not possible. At the time, I had thought this a little weird. The market is willing to pay for this. Why dismiss it so completely? But after doing this video, I feel more sympathetic to the wafer maker's plight. The 300mm wafer transition was a monumental effort. These companies moved heaven and earth to make it happen. Asking them to roll back the clock 20 years is impossible. Alright everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.